Amen. Thank you very much, ladies. I'll tell you. It has been a blessing this morning for sure. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Beginning with verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Key word there, by the way. Our Lord was moved with what? Compassion. compassion. Because they fainted. And were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. And we're going to continue to read beyond the chapter break. By the way, chapter breaks are simply just that. They're chapter breaks. Uh, who invented chapter breaks? We did. <laughs> we did, right? And so we continue with the flow of Scripture here. Now notice uh, chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him uh, his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Uh, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip, and Bartholo Bartholomew, uh, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Levius, uh, whose surname is Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. Who also betrayed him. And then notice verse 5. And the uh, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, key in here please, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, into the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Father, we do thank you for this morning. Already it's been a blessing just to uh, hear from your saints as uh, music has been sung to magnify and glorify you. A act of praise taking place in many different ways, described in many different ways, up to this point in the service. And an act of worship. And Lord, what we're about to do now, what we are already doing, is worshiping you and praising you. We would pray that uh, our attentive attention to what you have for us would demonstrate our, our praise and worship of you, Lord. Help us to just grab a hold of what you have for us today, Lord. Help us to see that you're not through with us. You're not through with one person in this room. And Lord, should uh, uh, another day go by, we want to be used by you. Speak to hearts, Father, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Now look again with me at Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Today, we are going to begin to talk about what the Bible has to say about evangelism. The word itself is a kind of a controversial word. We have people who are, who are confused over what an evangelist is, whether that, that's a called uh, position for an individual or, or not. Uh, can, should an evangelist be someone who comes into the church and preaches, or is that applicable to today? What is evangelism for the individual? What is personal evangelism versus, you know, 
a uh, church-wide evangelism. I want to know what the Bible has to say about all of these things, and so I want to focus on biblical evangelism. There's a lot of misunderstanding today about what evangelism is and what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to work and, and why we even talk about it. There's also a real concern today that it's not even interesting or important to a whole lot of people who call themselves Christians today. They hear of the one who's called the evangelist, but they know nothing about personal evangelism. They have no real sense of, of uh, the lateness of the hour and the importance of them being involved in sharing the gospel. Why is that? Well, I just think it's because we don't know our Bibles as well as we should. And so let's do this. Let's let God do the talking. Let's let that always be the case. Let's just start out right in the year 2015 and say, I want to know what the Lord has to say about biblical evangelism. I'll tell you one thing for sure. He's already told me, and so I'm going to tell you. This is what the Lord is saying to you. God can use you in 2015. Amen? God can use, yes, even little old me and little old you. Somebody say amen to that. That's right. No matter who you might be, no matter how long you might have been saved, I can tell you God has big plans for you and he wants to use you. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I can tell you what his plan is for you today. You want to know what his plan is? That you ask him into your heart to be your Savior. That you get saved today. That you don't walk away without knowing for sure you're on your way to heaven. Yes, you can be a signpost and point people to heaven, but you need to make sure you're going there first. Amen? You know, I'll tell you what, I love a testimony. My favorite one is mine. Amen? And if you're not saved, you don't have one. And so you want to be able to first know Christ as your Savior, and secondly, answer to these marching orders. God can use you in the year 1492. No, in the year 2015. Doesn't rhyme, but it matters. It does. Go ye. Who's ye? We be ye. Me and you. Go ye. Preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, Allegheny ants, a common species in the eastern United States, help enrich forest areas by carrying tons of soil from below ground to the surface. You know, we've got some strange ants that do some of that same kind of thing around here. You ever see the little piles that the ants make? It's kind of annoying, isn't it? A three-year study by the University of Wisconsin revealed that one colony of ants moved 15 tons of subsoil, building clusters of large mounds and uh, burrowing five and a half feet below the surface. This deep plowing increased nutrients, clay, and organic matter of the surface soil in the forest. It's amazing what a little ant can do. Matter of fact, it's no wonder uh, the, the proverb says, go to the ant, consider her ways, and be wise. You know, I never got over being a kid when it comes to just watching ants and being amazed at how they work how they continue to work, work, work. You know, we had the cutter ants around here. You know what I'm talking about? Brother Jaime knows what I'm talking about because he's had to cut them down a few times at my house. And then they'll completely uh, make a tree bare. Uh, just one little piece of a leaf at a time. May I tell you something? I think if God can use this Allegheny ant in the north and the way we see uh, insects even used in the south, uh, that Allegheny ant that can move 15 tons of subsoil to the surface, surely God can use you in the year 2015. Amen? I can tell you it's not about uh, how much you can do right away. It's how committed you are to sticking to doing what God wants you to do. You see, God can use you when you see others compassionately. You know, one of the mistakes that we make, I think, is especially uh, Christians who run with others that, uh, you know, are serious about preaching a hot hell and, and, and preaching against sin and talking about, you know, how important it is to walk with the Lord and, and not 
will be struggling in sin, sometimes we forget a word that matters very much to the Lord because he demonstrated it himself. Compassion. Compassion. Compassion is missing today in too many circles. Jesus remained consistently compassionate. I, I, I just want to make that as clear as I possibly can. For some of us who have fallen into this false idea that, that you know, it's all about, well, these people better be get saved, and if they don't get saved, they're going to go to hell, and they deserve it. They don't know their Bible. The Lord wouldn't that one would perish, but that all would be saved. You see, our Lord demonstrated for us while he walked on this planet what real compassion is all about. And it was consistent, uh, uh, a, a, a consistent work of compassion in him. I think for you and I today, having the consistency of compassion in our life is important. That we don't just, you know, tell people about the Lord kind of, you know, sometimes when we feel like it. But... We have a rich understanding that this would be the heart attitude of every believer. For the Lord, from the time he sent his disciples on their first witnessing mission until his death. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. It really is true, isn't it? People don't care how much they know until they know how much you care. And you know, you can impress people with how much you think you're capable of doing, but when they know that they matter to you, it makes a big difference. I was thinking of how many uh, years I've been in the ministry and how there have been times when I have put a lot of work into a particular uh, situation where I'm trying to encourage someone. And may I tell you, it doesn't always work out. Things don't always go the way you wish they'd go. But you know what? For every for everyone that I can think of over the years that, that just kind of, you know, stagnated and didn't move forward for the Lord, I can tell you about others. Whom God has gotten a hold of and has used mightily and wonderfully. But you know what? I still can tell you that it's the ones that are still struggling, the ones that are still just kind of plowing along that, you know, I, you know, my heart breaks for. I have compassion for them. But more importantly, I have compassion for the lost. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not man-made. It has to be supernatural. It has to be me reminding myself that the Lord loves the lost more than I ever will. The Lord loves the lost more than you ever will. And our compassion is, is birthed in that. You see, because of the power of Christian love, God can use, yes, you. I want you to know if you didn't think so, that for sure this first message in the year 2015 is for you. It's not for the person sitting next to you. It's not for anybody else. It's for you. I usually probably do what most pastors do when it comes to this business of encouraging people to be involved in sharing the gospel. I'm usually pretty polite about it. Forgive me, this morning I'm not going to be. This morning, I am going to, with all the pathos that I can conjure up, implore you and appeal, appeal to you to have a burden for the lost and to want to win souls to Christ. I think it's high time that we quit dancing around this issue and quit being polite and quit telling everybody, hey, it's okay that you don't seem to be interested in telling anybody else about the Lord. I don't know how much more time we have left. I don't know. The Lord does. But I can tell you this. Maybe we preachers have been remiss in not truly challenging each and every one of us individually to get back 
in the saddle to get back in the game, to get